Okay, let me describe how, how this uh, session will work. Um, the, the five people who've spoken so far this morning have valiantly agreed to, to face the press or to answer, answer the questions. Now, please bear in mind that though they are fonts of wisdom, they don't know everything. And there are particularly with the um, CHISP, um, the Commonwealth Home Supports Program, if you went to the, um, the, um, the roadshow you'll, you, and you listen to the presentations, you'll be aware that there's still a lot of detail to, to, to work out and this, this current consultation period is going to assist those decisions. So you might not get questions, your questions fully answered today, but we'll do our darndest. I've got a number of questions that have, that have come into the council um, and I might kick off with a couple of them and, and, um, and, and feed some through during the next hour. Um, but I will also be asking for questions from the floor. If you could please wait for the microphone because we are, we are recording and, uh, so, and if you could state who you are and where you're from would be, would be not only polite but would be very a big help to us. Um, we have, I've got some questions about funding and eligibility, some about planning and allocation, and some about housing sustainability. I'm going to start with, um, with a question that's been partially answered this morning, but uh, let's, 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 let's see if we can get a, a more complete answer. Is, um, what are the, the time frames for the full implementation of the NDIS and the new aged care system? I don't know. <laughs> 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 um, it, well, it varies state by state in terms of when we actually... I mean, 2020 is the outside date, but uh, the, the things will start to change um, post the trial period. So that will very much depend on the negotiations between the governments as to how um, things roll out beyond just the um, trial sites as they currently exist. I know no, agree. Um, I think I believe it's being negotiated at the moment. But New South Wales did sign on to, as you know, the three years in the launch site, and then statewide rollout between 16 and 18. So the launch site, of course, will influence what happens with that. But they're the timeframes statewide that we're certainly working towards. In terms of aged care reform, um, as people might have seen on Michelle's slide, there's been successive waves since um, the reforms were announced in 2004. So there was a bunch of stuff mid last, uh, yeah, mid last year. So my aged care. Uh, new supplements, new levels of home care packages, mid this year, so um, from next week there's the changes around financing and changes to accommodation payments and so on as part of the reforms, and then for home support it's July 2015. Raj, hang on to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next question is, is, um, pro uh, is um, a rather a technical question uh, about home mods, but what, what, <coughs> what are we thinking will happen to those clients who are already registered for home mods uh, service allocation? as part of, of the part of the system in New South Wales at the 30th of June next year, but who are awaiting their jobs or their jobs are half completed or partially completed? Um, again, that's probably a, quite a specific question that mm. I don't really have a, a, um, a perfect answer for. Generally, the agreements under those four programs, including HAC, where home mods are provided, uh, include sort of transition out clauses. So um, those agreements end on 30 June 2015. Mm -hmm. So there'll be broadly the arrangements that are set out there, which I think ordinarily is usually a three month transition out period. What, I mean, what we'll obviously try and do is make sure we have clear advice out to the sector around the approach that we'll apply around the selection of providers. Mm. So things like, um, on the one hand, is it a largely contestable process, in which case that'll follow its own timeframes, or are we looking to have um, a mixture where some things like growth and other things are contestable, but others um, there's continuity for service providers. Mm -hmm. um, what about um, the discussion paper talks a, a bit about the um, home maintenance side of, of, uh, of HM&M. Um, and um, if it's going to be limited under, under the new program, particularly the ongoing, those who receive ongoing services, um, what, are, what provisions are you thinking will be made for those um, who are currently receiving regular lawn mowing, for instance, and other assistance, and, and are you thinking about any grandparenting arrangements there? 
Uh, so the department's committed to work with the National Age Care Alliance on the transition arrangements for home support broadly. Um, and the discussion paper sets out a few of the areas where we've acknowledged it's particularly critical to do that. So things like transition of service group two, which Michelle touched on, given that some of those things are going to my age care. Other parts we're proposing go to things like the National Age Care Advocacy Program. Uh, clients with high levels of need, so um, often things like cops and linkages uh, and so on. Um, looking at specific transition arrangements for that group and also um, particularly clients under 65. So under the Respite for Carers program, we do have a small cohort of carers of younger clients that we need to look at transition arrangements generally. So um, really what we're trying to do across all of home support is um, refocus to basics So and also target those things which are most effective in people keeping people safely in their own homes. What the subgroup and the review um, found was that um, there is that sort of grey area around some of the home mods, particularly garden maintenance, which things actually contribute directly towards those outcomes and which are kind of um, things which may be less directly attributed to that. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is across all of home support we'll be looking at transition arrangements and things like uh, existing clients and where we are proposing changes either to um, things like home maintenance or um, other parts of the program with their specific transition arrangements or indeed even the next question I have is, is, is a bit about block funding, but it also seems to be a bit about the interface between um, the regional assessment services and, and home mod services. So what do you think that block funding actually will mean for providers of home mods and maintenance under the new program? And will this continue to include the requirement for, for those services to determine which clients are eligible or, uh, um, um, and uh, the scoping of jobs, particularly by OTs, and what jobs are prioritised over others? Um, I think that's got a few different elements. So mm. things like um, determination of eligibility, that would be through my aged care. So um, clients, and this is set out on, I think, page 33 of the discussion paper, there's a diagram which sets out the proposed entry to the program arrangements. So for some services, that might be direct from the contact centre through to service provision. For others, there'll be face-to-face -face assessment. And then there's other streams where people only require information or if it's, um, they require a comprehensive assessment to get into a home care package or resi care or residential respite or so on. Um, I've lost the first part of that question. Um, <coughs> it was... Um, oh, block funding and how that relates? Yeah, how it relates. Yeah, so under, and one of the things that was a consideration in terms of um, the proposition that we maintain block funding uh, in the short term was an acknowledgement that through other systems, including NDIS, that providers, and we know that there's a lot of providers who deliver both disability and aged care services, they will have a mixed model where mm -hmm. over time they'll have a greater proportion of their funding which is um, not through block funding. So having a combination of hopefully um, some certainty through block funding in terms of home support and then a blended model where they may also get um, funding through individualised uh, arrangements with clients through NDIS. Um, we're not proposing to change the nature of the current block funding, so there's nothing in of, and of itself in terms of home support compared to HAC at the moment where we're saying we'd fundamentally change the nature in which we would block fund. Mm -hmm. So it's reasonable continuity in that sense. And um, yeah, as I was saying earlier, we're not proposing to, apart from potentially trialling some things like maybe cashing out respite and that sort of stuff, we're not proposing to introduce individualised funding models in home support from July 15. Thank you. Give you a rest now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I might <laughs> chance um, my hand with <laughs> questions from the floor. But let, let, I guess the next question is is probably for um, for uh, Wendy and Mary. Um, given that not all people with disability will be eligible for funding under the NDIS, um, what processes will be in place for those clients? who aren't eligible to gain access to subsidisation for major or complex modifications? Frankly, I think I'd be a little surprised if they weren't, if someone who needed that wasn't eligible for NDIS. Um, there may be some people who have um, not a permanent disability, as I mentioned earlier, who may need something uh, short term to, um, you know, post-hospital. Um, now, some of them may even come into NDIS under the early intervention um, uh, category that we have. 
Um, but I think anyone who has a substantial disability and needs major modifications under 65 will meet all the criteria for NDIS. Yeah, just um, two sort of components to add to that. One is around um, the tier system of the NDIS. Uh, it does cater for all people with disability, permanent disability in the country, and they may not everybody may not get their own individual package, but of course there's tier two, which has things like our Ability Links program in it that do help people who have um, a milder level of disability who might just need community connections to set those up. So there are ways of people who may not get an individual package will still be eligible for an NDIS. It's much broader than just a funded package. Parallel to that though, in the launch site, um, we've certainly seen with people who are getting transitioned, particularly from the old CCSP program, mm -hmm. uh, those people that haven't been eligible are people that weren't actually eligible largely for the CCSP anyway. So largely they didn't have permanent disabilities. They had things that they could have gotten better from, for example, and probably shouldn't have been getting the services in the first place. So that's the only thing we're seeing when people are, haven't been eligible to date. I think um, certainly Attic has been delighted with the number of people that have been able to transition successfully and fully to get packages. Um, I guess I'd like to flip down to probably the end now, to down to Anne, because I think you probably have the, the better grasp of, the, of this question, but uh, probably the whole panel might want to, uh, to input. Look, what effects are you thinking will flow on from the capping of the Commonwealth contributions to home mods at, at 10 grand? And, and where do you think additional funds for complex modifications might come from? If I could um, recall a time at the subgroup five review meet, advisory committee meeting, at one point when we were discussing caps and it came in up in the conversation and should there be caps or shouldn't there be caps and should we be funding it? And um, so I'm very glad there's a cap <laughs> of some sort there. Um, but I remember uh, as we went around the table, um, uh, other representatives of peaks and organisations associated with home mods and maintenance or goods and equipment in other states and territories were going around and talking about the caps they have for their states and territories. And as it got closer and closer to my chair, I became more and more nervous because we looked at 2,000, 5,000, 4,000, zero, and 10, I think, was the closest to ours. And uh, I do distinctly remember the cricket, hearing the crickets in the room when I said, oh, ours is 40,000. <laughs> And, but it's only been capped at that since 2012. Prior to that, there actually wasn't uh, a cap on it. And um, there was a stunned silence in the, the room at that point. For us in New South Wales, um, not the bar, but the benchmark is in, in terms of capping is going down. Um, I didn't, don't believe remotely, and we discussed this actually at our state council meeting yesterday, most people are aware that a national program with an equitable national program could not possibly be, uh, be sustained at that level of um, uh, subsidy. Um, I remember arguing for 25,000. I remember a more deadly silence happening <laughs> around the table uh, because I was basing that on some of the average costs that we have for some of the, um, what we were in New South Wales would call level two uh, home mods, um, both uh, in the regional and uh, metropolitan and rural, and but not remotely the remote. <laughs> and um, but ten seemed to be the agreed uh, amount, and I would be surprised if that moved from from that amount. Hopefully, it won't go down, but I, I can't imagine it would go up. Um, and from that, um, my major worry in that was we would all know here that um, as block-funded service providers, um, particularly for major modifications, we've been mandated or able to um, provide paying off uh, payment terms for our clients that are interest-free. Um, we have really tightened, since the 2012 review, we really tightened the criteria for uh, asking for a subsidy or asking for a client fees reduction with it. And I was saying to Michelle, I think we've got some good work that we've done here in New South Wales through Attic as well too, that um, we can provide to the aged care reforms to inform fees um, policy for them in terms of major modifications. But um, I remember there was um, a trial in Queensland, I think a small trial, uh, looking at drawdown on equity for major modifications. I think only about three people took it up. <laughs> in an 18 month period. Um, our current cohort, I don't believe, is really ready for the reverse mortgage and the drawdown on equity. Uh, our current cohort is um, predominantly, I would believe, in New South Wales between 73 and 87. 
and they're just not quite ready with it. They don't understand it. They're edgy about it. I, get, I think given another five to ten years, even five years, I think you're looking at a different cohort who would be more amenable to, to that type of financing of their ongoing care or particularly a community service that involves their major asset, their home. I really worry about the um, financial institutions who might leap on this for vulnerable people in terms of the type of products they provide to them for drawdown of equity. Um, a couple of times in our review meetings, I've mentioned the idea of minister's equity in some of our major modifications that the government eventually will get something back from it. Um, so I don't know how the fees policy um, committee is looking at anything like that. Um, it's very hard to buy a property these days that hasn't got some kind of caveat on it. So it might well be um, uh, an interesting way to move forward on a national basis uh, for home modifications. When you look at drawdown on equity, you've got to remember again the rural and remote service provision where um, <laughs> to just to do a bathroom uh, on the value of a property it might be taking 40 or 50% of the actual value of the entire property to, to get an access and a bathroom modification loan. So I'm concerned, very concerned about um, what will happen above that $10,000 limit. Uh, and I'm concerned about the impact ongoing, particularly in New South Wales, on the health system, on the waiting list for uh, nursing homes, on what is going to happen. Are people just going to take themselves to a hospital um, uh, because they can't get their home modified in order to um, either take on the wellness and reablement approaches or even have the ongoing services? So, so they're my concerns in terms of um, uh, ongoing financing of that. And um, I'd also like to raise the, the idea of contestability for financial institutions who are interested in um, <laughs> providing financial products to our somewhat vulnerable um, target group of people as well. I think that's very important that the government definitely at least takes a look at that and has a look at the products that are on the market. Does anybody else on the panel want to contribute? I guess the only other thing that I would say is if you obviously have read the discussion paper and it is about a basic program and it is about a little bit of service for a lot of people. So on that basis and looking at what was happening nationally, really the committee had no nowhere to go in terms of looking at anything like the 40,000 cap that we had previously. And I can tell you that Attic felt that it was unsustainable mm -hmm. too. So it's something that would have changed long term anyway. Um, and I do understand that there are issues around those basic kind of um, renovations of bathrooms um, and of kitchens that can cost around $25,000. Modification. Modification. Not really. And I do also <laughs> understand, <laughs> sorry, language. And I, um, and I do also understand the issues for remote um, people in terms of doing those modifications. So they are things that we'll still feed back to government. Don't know that we'll get anywhere, but we will feed that back. I have just got one tiny thing to add as the microphone makes its way down. Um, about the $40,000 cap, that was put in place back in the day where the, com the programs were combined. So it was older people, and obviously this new cap is being talked about for the aged care population, whereas the $40,000 was put in place to support younger people with disability who had a whole lifetime with fairly severe needs in their house. So it's actually a different figure, and the reason it was put in place was for different purposes. We had to juggle two different cohorts with very different needs, as we're certainly hearing and seeing play out in practice. But we certainly didn't want to disadvantage people with disability who wanted and needed to live at home. And so that's why that 40,000 is in place, which I'm sure you all know, but I did want to clarify because it does get confusing, I suppose, when other states do have very low, low caps. Good. Well, that's a nice segue. Um, <laughs> so under NDIS, we don't have any caps. Um, and we also have increased flexibility. So... When you're starting to talk big money for modifications, you might also be talking about feasibility. And so we we are able to have those conversations. Because, and I know from my um, background in personal injury insurance, sometimes it was a better deal to actually um, purchase a new place and we contribute to the uh, one that's more easily modifiable or is already uh, more... Um, suitable for a person so we and if we contribute the equivalent of what we you know or something that we would have had to pay but you know there comes a t there comes a point where you go is this actually a worthwhile proposition so so with that you know additional flexibility um, we, we're able to accommodate um, people's um, needs the other thing is that housing is a huge issue for people with disability 
<coughs> and one of the other things that NDIA is looking at is how we can get some um, interested financial institutions to perhaps um, partner in, uh, in actually um, getting engaged in um, building um, su more suitable housing for people who, uh, you know, currently can't access um, their own um, place of residence. You know, they're, they're renting and the rental's not, you know, suitable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, particularly those who acquire a disability um, uh, or who have a condition that deteriorates significantly, and then their needs um, change and they and they need a more accessible environment. So all of those things are on the table there somewhere. Uh, when we get beyond, you know, what it is that we've got to open an office and, you know, which number of people are coming in the door next week. Um, so we've got, th there's a range of those bigger um, uh, subjects that have to be tackled through NDIS and through the trial period. Mary, hang on to that microphone, Mary. <laughs> um, the gateway um, has been marketed to the sector as the intake and referral point for access to aged care post-2015. Um, the Many in the room will remember the expansion of the Hunter Region Access Point to all New South Wales home mod service providers and how it was, um, it was not the most successful initiative and was, was quickly abandoned. Now it's understood that other access point projects for people with a disability have been undertaken in other states and territories. Now Mary, what intake and referral and reporting systems will be in place ongoing across New South Wales for those people with a disability um, who might not be eligible for NDIS, and when will this be instigated? Is that something that you can answer? Or mm, might no, be pro pro possibly not. It's not something that, I mean, w the NDIS at one level works on a very individual basis, but um, as Wendy's always already said, there is that tier two, which is that other level of service provision, which I, I do roughly describe as there if you need it um, for anybody. Um, so, so that, that may be an option, but I suspect that given a national presence, everyone will know where their closest um, NDIA office is and that will be a point of contact. And from there, we will be able to actually assist people in um, connecting them to the right kind of service if they're not going to be a, um, an NDIS participant. Um, we also are in the process of uh, improving the um, information on our website which is about what services and what providers are available in, in the local area in which we're operating. That will expand as time goes on. We want to make our website a very accessible um, place for people to come and get a whole range of information that you know, helps them actually meet their needs without perhaps ever coming to the agency. So that is another thing, one of those other big, you know, big subjects that we need to really um, get on top of. But um, in, in the not too distant future, people will be able to see how we're going to actually improve what, just at least with our registered providers to start, and then we will actually move on to the other community services that are of relevance to people in their local area. So that, and we hope it'll be what well, it's meant to be, this, you know, you butte responsive uh, website for people. But we've always got our 1800 number, if none of that works. Great, uh, are there any other questions from the floor about um, funding and eligibility? Ah. Philippa. So people with a chronic uh, disease would still be eligible for NDIS? Not necessarily. This is the group that I think a lot of us are feeling might be left out. So can you clarify that a little bit? Yeah. So um, the NDIS uh, legislation talks about substantial disability, so an impairment that results in substantial disability that affects uh, the various domains of functioning. So chronic disease of itself, no. Chronic disease that results in a permanent impairment and subsequent substantial disability, 
perhaps, yeah, that, that, that person may. So, for example, the simple example is diabetes. Diabetes itself doesn't make you eligible for NDIS. Diabetes where you've had to have an amputation would probably make you eligible. Yep. Um, do any other questions? Obviously, you've given me a reablement and wellness approach to handing the microphone around. Thank you. I just want to ask, look, with the NDIS now, obviously we've got the age group and we've got the disability groups, whether you've looked into the, the spectrum of disabilities, like with uh, particularly you've got the deaf and the, the blind and then you've got the disability that you can't see, intellectual disability. But, of course, a common thread here with modifications, they will all need houses done or looked after in some way. So I'm wondering now, because without being disrespectful to elderly people, they only get a disability as a result of old age. That's all. But for our people, our children that are born that way, they're still left behind, the, you know, the eight ball. And I would hate to see something happen like um, the Richmond report, because this NDIS, NDIS was... Goff Whitlam's little baby, so it's taken that long to come to fruition. So you're rushing through something. So let's look at the Richmond report and what happened with that. The people are out in the streets. So what happens to our children, in particular, the group home where my son is, is at Act Run. Now, my job is to make sure that he's got that continuity and that environment. So what happens when uh, 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 a private NGO takes over? This boy of mine has been away for 20 years and he is now comfortable in his own surroundings and he's not going to... I'm not going to allow that to happen, you know, to him because we fought that long to get there. And um, so I'm thinking along those lines and I'm also thinking along the lines about people that have a disability and have received, a, a, say, a couple of million dollars settlement. What happens when they buy a place and then um, they don't have any money left over? Are they eligible to come to your scheme? So that's my question anyway. Okay, so I'll tackle the first one first. Um, so we have got people in the Hunter already who are in the group homes. Um, some are NGO run and some are ADAC run and they still get their own individual um, funding package. So the, so the, the cost of um, staying, and most people choose to stay where they are, they're not choosing to move, not yet anyway. Although there was one person who did actually choose to move um, and, uh, and so we, we, um, she has her own package and so, but that follows, it follows the person, right? So if they choose to go somewhere different, their funding package goes with them. Um, th I'll leave uh, Wendy talk about what happens from the ADAC run to the NGO when that, when that transition's over. Um, and then uh, the second part of your question is about uh, compensation. It's a, it's a little bit more complicated. But just um, in a nutshell, I'll say it this way. If a person in their settlement st um, has money that was um, meant for their uh, ongoing care and they still have some of that money, we will ask for that as a contribution to their overall uh, package of funding. However, what we find is, and the reason that lifetime care was set up here in New South Wales was because most of those lump sum settlements were totally inadequate to cater for people's lifetime needs. So, um, therefore, they're quite likely they won't have any money. That's, they'll have expended their money. Some of those people are actually receiving packages through ADAC right now because they don't. That their compensation's gone, and we're finding that in across in both Victoria and New South Wales. So they get into the NDIS because they've got it. They they meet all the criteria. And the only other, the only question we have to ask ourselves is. Do they have some funds that are supposed to be, you know, quarantined, if you like, or put away for their ongoing personal care and support? Occasionally you find somebody who's got something. Not necessarily the full, you know, they don't have the full thing. So, um, yes, yeah, so they're still eligible and we just work out if do they, should they make a financial contribution or not. Yep. And to speak about the addict transition part, so I can't give 
precision around when that happens and who the organisation will be transitioned to and all that sort of business. But when individuals get their own package, as Mary said, they can choose to stay in that in that particular group home. But what Attic is trying to do to maximise sustainability there is the legislation that we've put in place talks about continuity of staff. We've agreed a wage wages and award conditions to continue for a couple of years to make sure that staff can stay in those group homes. We also have been negotiating with non-government organisations as well around keeping uh, that consistency there for people. But I guess ultimately it was agreed that the non-government sector would be more sustainable than Attic to deliver it, but with as many consistencies as possible that the people with disability choose in that house. So it might be that they actually do choose to have some staffing changes, in which case that would be supported as well. But ultimately, if it is... And we are certainly hearing from people and their families that they do want that continuity. We will um, absolutely support that so that people who have lived together for 20 years and worked together for 20 years will be able to continue into the non-government sector. Absolutely. And that's where families, consultation with families and your input into that is, of course, key as well. Okay, let's move in and talk about planning. When do you indicated that um, the planning regions of the old DADAC... <laughs> Um, we're, there were six planning regions. We've now moved and, and aligned with the 15... Uh, 16 or 17? Uh, 15. 15 yeah. um, the districts. Um, and Raj, you talked about planning um, happening... Uh, I'm just wondering how DSS planning will go. Is it, um, what are the regions um, and what, what, um, what methods will be used to determine funding levels through planning? Um, so currently there's, I think, 54 HAC planning regions nationally. The intent is to move home support onto the aged care planning regions. There's slightly more. I think there's about 70-odd. For some states, that will have some changes. I, th I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it might be Queensland and um, Northern Territory that have more aged care planning regions than HAC regions. But for a lot of other jurisdictions, there's reasonable concordance between um, HAC and ACAR... And sorry, aged care planning regions. I think part of what we're doing through home support is consolidating those three, maybe four programs, and then also, um, in, excuse me, integrating those within the aged care system more generally. So what that will mean is rather than going out on a separate funding round around day therapy centres or HAC or something else, there'll be a much more whole of aged care consideration around what's the current supply of things like packages and respite and residential care, and how does that relate to the kind of demand that we're seeing for other parts of the system through home support and other things. So um, for me it's interesting because I think what we're trying to do is integrate at the HK level. What we've been hearing through consultations is that that has challenges with some of the other sectors. So for things like hospitals, if they use local health districts or other things or Medicare local regions, what we're trying to do is make sure that aged care is sensible and integrated, but inevitably, if you're a provider, and there was an example, I think, in one of the Sydney um, briefings where someone worked for a health service, they got hack allied health money and they also had state allied health money, and they were saying, well, here are the arrangements which are now consistent or becoming consistent across aged care, but that raises a different set of issues for us as a provider of allied health services. And that's going to cut across a number of things, including fees and, and yeah, a number of things. Um, yeah, so I think um, moving towards a single set of aged care planning regions that's the basis across the whole of the system and doing that at a program level for home support across those three or four programs so that we're not making decisions um, about like care or support which used to be or is currently under NRCP in isolation of some of the other things um, in other parts of those programs will be I think one of the benefits of having that change to home support. Um, I want to move. On. We want to now move on to something that that Anne stressed in in her address, um, the issue of uh, remoteness, uh, which is uh, one I know that is central to a number of people in this room, um, and a number of people who can't be here and and across Australia. Um, how will the issues of remoteness that affect home modification services, uh, in particular, be recognised and addressed? Yeah. As part of home support, or yeah, generally, yeah, or yeah. yeah. Um, I think part of it hinges on where we land on contestability. So um, <coughs> currently we have a range of different prices for different service types in different locations. And so implicit in that is um, responding to local needs. So the amount that we might fund a provider for a service in Broken Hill is different from what we might do in uh, the capital city. If we... Um, 
if the decision is that we go to a more widely contestable process for all of home support, then it will be that um, competitive process that looks to set the prices around different services in different locations. So I think implicit in that is that either um, we currently have a structure which acknowledges local circumstance, including remoteness, um, for the service types that we fund. And again, even if we were to change and make those um, the selection process through a competitive one, then again, it would be driven by what providers come to us and say is the cost of delivery in their region. In terms of looking at testability, is it um, advisable now um, for home modification services to really do some comprehensive unit costing exercises to take into account factors such as uh, remoteness? I think it's a general principle then that's worthwhile doing. Um, providers need to know the cost of undertaking a business um, and then that needs to be reflected either in a renegotiated funding agreement or if they choose to, to tender for service into the future. Um. It's coming down Anne's way. <laughs> um, a question on, on unit costing. Um, I've been uh, in the sector nearly 20 years. A lot of people have been a, a little bit longer than I have as well too. And we've seen many, many attempts in the hack fees policy to try and put a unit cost on home modifications, uh, none of which have been remotely successful. Um, in the Hunter trial site, I know for major mods, I think it's gone to a quote system as well with it. Um, a bit of an example, I, um, under the NDIS, and I'm not having a, a, way, a, a position one way or the other here with it, but I think they settled on, I think it was $38.50 an hour for lawn mowing. With the quality um, items that we have to jump through in order to have received our funding previously and continue to receive funding, um, services, I know the home mod services in that area are really struggling. They can't, they can't provide lawn mowing at that cost with it. But obviously somebody can. Obviously a contractor can or someone else. But we, um, I think a conundrum for our services that I've heard many times over is that when you look at unit costing, um, there is no way we can compete in an open market if we've previously had to provide all sorts of quality reporting, all sorts of quality data collection, meeting all the standards, whether they be aged care standards, disability standards, with it, we will never be able to compete in, in that kind of field when it comes down to price pointing. The other thing with home modifications, particularly major modifications, and um, I, I, my particular service crosses two regions that are, are, are regional and coastal and, and go inland to rural and slightly remote, but not, rem <laughs> not, not too much, though we do hit the snow now. <laughs> um, and we, can, cannot, we cannot provide uh, at the same cost from one location to another. So putting a unit cost on a home modification, even in putting in a rail, because putting in a rail um, uh, in the country area or needing a sparky or an electrician in a country area where there just isn't any contractors to be found and they, par they will charge a premium rate to, to do it um, or to get a quality contractor to do it is, is, is just unfeasible. Um, it adds time and it um, sometimes negates the uptake by clients of, of really essential services that they need with it. So I guess I'd just like to put that forward that in terms of unit costing, um, home mold and maintenance have, have never really, again, we're the square peg in the round um, hole of community services. <laughs> Yeah, just one point to add to that, I suppose, is that um, while I agree with what Anne's saying in terms of the unit costing as a formula to provide funding, that's one thing, but unit costing for you as in managing your business and understanding how much it costs to do oh, business yeah. is a separate thing and you must understand that in the current climate, you must understand that. That was actually the point I was going to make, so thank you. But also just to also um, outline again a few things that we have put in place with NDS that will assist with that. As I said, there's going to be a Deloitte's tool, which was Commonwealth funded specifically for the NDIS, uh, which will work with unit costing for your business operations and how you deliver services. So it's not home modification specific, but it does look at whole of organisation. And one of the one of the perks with that is uh, it will align with MYOB for people who can manage uh, who manage their business systems that way. But we also have things like the productivity tool that look at your back of office functions. There'll be a social impact tool that look at the, the type of um, 
investment your organisation has that's not necessarily in cash, it's, on, it, it's in what you do socially and what the appeal of that is. And that helps you to have, I guess, an overall understanding of what it does cost and what you offer as a non-government provider as opposed perhaps to a for-profit provider who can deliver things more cheaply. So there's a whole spectrum of things there that can help you do that. But yeah, it's really important to know, obviously, your, your business operation costs because that will help you position yourself uh, wherever that might be. Um, and uh, and I mean we we for the more expensive um, um, home modifications we are certainly looking for competitive quotes, so that's the way that will go. So you know following on from Wendy, it's very important that you know what is the cost of delivering a service. Um, I have heard the arguments about all the quality standards, etc. At the moment, where nothing is changing, but it will eventually change. Um, and and uh, I mean, one of the things that you know, one of the big questions that people have, and I've just come from the National Quality Working Group, and um, the big questions is like, what's been the impact of them? What difference have they made? Has it actually increased, you know, the um, the guarantee of both quality and outcome for the people with disability? So um, that that will change over time. Um, and, uh, and for the more minor things where you, you actually need a, a, um, a, a tradesperson who can actually do the job well and do it quickly and efficiently, um, that's probably the person who will get the job, um, really, because um, it, it, that they, they will, they'll be there, they'll be local, and, and that also means that for the more, um, for country regions and that, it means that we'll also be looking to um, provide um, employment opportunities for local people who are, are appropriately qualified and, and can do the job as well. Uh, yes, I didn't mean to infer that I, um, the council or the, the sector doesn't agree with getting to know what it costs you to uh, be here for every hour that you are here with it. Um, and uh, price pointing is something we do have to look at because we ha we're, we're not e we haven't not been educated, but we haven't lived in a culture where that was of vital importance to us. And it is something that the council has discussed uh, in great detail, and uh, why we put on days like today to make you start thinking about it. If hopefully you you've already been thinking about it, but to give you some tools and some strategies to move forward on that as well. I guess it is that 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 concern for us um, about um, price setting, as in this is what you get, this is all you can um, apply for, you know, for an hour of this, or, or um, in terms of the type of services that we do with it. But um, there's no reason we can't provide quality service um, at competitive prices. Um, quality costs, though. Quality does cost with it, and um, I think it will probably come down to, as you say, Mary, uh, an individual organisational basis of work out what your costs are and work out how you can still provide a quality service um, at a cost that will be competitive, uh, either in disability or aged care in your region. Um, let's move on to some across government um, issues. One, one, there's there's an indication that uh, New South Wales Health may be cutting back on uh, um, on uh, occupational therapists, and, and in some regions. And when this happens, it has a significant impact on on, on home modifications and the assessment of them. Um, look, what strategies are planned to ensure that there's joint decision making over this, uh, and 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 should there be cutbacks, um, what strategies could be in place to ensure that there's a, a reasonable supply of, of OTs to, in fact, uh, to uh, assess home mod jobs? I'm quite sure who that one goes to. Um, well, a couple of things. Um, first of all, is that, I mean, there is allegedly a shortage of OTs. My God, we've got more OT schools <laughs> than, than ever before. Um, but um, there's a lot in private practice. Um, and uh, and basically we we are looking to work with all the professional associations about um, perhaps having continuing professional education in terms of what's needed in some of these areas um, and and prescribing of um, appropriate uh, assistive technology is clearly one of the things that we've got a high level interest in there is also a lot of um, work going on on work for the, the work this um, sector um, workforce requirements and and that includes allied health professionals so there is a national uh, um, project occurring on that so once again that will be another thing that will come to you know into the mix 
Um, and the other thing is that you don't always actually need a health professional. As I said, we've got that new initiative on um, developing up a course for, um, for perhaps a, a certificate four level for um, mentors for people um, with disability to actually select at the at the lower level of complexity. So there will be that. I wouldn't. I'd be surprised also. If perhaps some as time goes on, if some of the um, trades don't start to think about. I wonder if we should become a bit more skilled in this area, and that may be something that we could al also actually assist the development of through the sector development um, funding that we can make available. Um, down in South Australia, they've already um, um, undertaken a trial of a, a Cert four level for repairs of assistive technology. So that's another um, initiative that's actually already occurred. So I think you'll start to see a lot of things happen. Um, and, uh, and as I say, we would be looking for the appropriate skilled therapist of whatever kind to actually provide the prescription. Um, if they're local and they're in with New South Wales Health, great. If they're not, we will be sourcing another one. And uh, just to sort of add on a sort of more practical level in some ways to that as well, um, certainly New South Wales is excited to see... Well, sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> administrative and bureaucratical then, <laughs> maybe not practical at all. Certainly excited to see those those initiatives sort of ha coming up. But in signing on to the NDIS, the New South Wales government signed on to that. So it's not just ADEC, it's health signs on to that, education signs on to that. Anybody who has any intersection with younger people with disability has committed to making this scheme work. So certainly in the Hunter launch site and then more broadly across the state, there's a task force that meet together with all those key state agencies, also with the NDIA and DSS, to, to talk about these ramifications and what does it mean for different program areas and different health departments and what have you. So actually it's, it's, it's far less practical than what Mary was talking about, but it is the arrangement that we have in place to keep an eye on these sorts of things and what the implications of those might be. But the NDIS will open doors for different types of service delivery and much more innovative types of service delivery than I guess our old uh, you know, block funded and regimented model did. So in the meantime, we as a state are negotiating how, how we pass over to that, but eagerly awaiting some of these um, activities that will blossom with the NDIS. Um, I mentioned um, in my opening speech that um, uh, having been privileged to sit on the national committees and, and talk to people doing some of the design of the national programs, um, I've learned about other home mods maintenance providers or suppliers. Um, New South Wales is completely unique. The entire country does home mods and, and maintenance in a completely ad hoc manner with it. Nothing is remotely the same. And when I would talk about, I make the joke that when I, I remember the first time I raised the idea that we I do HMMS, and somebody asked, "Oh, does the Navy provide services for you <laughs> with it?" Because HMMS only exists actually as a, an acronym here in New South Wales. When I would talk about level one, level two, level three, I'd just get completely blank stares from people because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the country. Um, the, the idea of um, the New South Wales State Council driving forward to, uh, as um, an organised network, driving forward to bring in the other states and territories to uh, a national um, organisation, a big push for that was about getting training um, uh, organised, uh, not just for OTs, not just for builders, but for that combination, particularly of OTs and builders, which is just the core part of what our, our major modifications is, uh, are all about with it. So I, I really um, I look forward to um, the members in our New South Wales network learning about some of the fantastic training and some fan fantastic systems that are out there in other states and territories uh, and, and gaining access to that information. And, and Home Mods Australia, Modera, bringing all of that together in, in um, uh, hopefully a one-stop shop and a one-stop voice for OTs, for builders, for suppliers, uh, and most particularly for clients, particularly those interested in doing their own home modifications as well too. It needs to be a point um, of excellence. I know there's going to be an aged care centre of excellence. 
<laughs> or I hope there is going to be from what they're saying. And, and this needs to be the type of um, information that we can provide to those type of institutions as well. So, you know, going to a national um, organisation opens up the opportunities. While it opens up the market, and, and um, you know, we'd all be not, not keen to say, isn't that a fabulous thing? <laughs> but the fact is that the market is going to open, end of story with it. So we need to have any client being able to be serviced with a home modification uh, assessment or installation uh, at good, best quality at best practice, and that's what Home Modifications Australia um, as a national organisation hopes to achieve. Do we have any other questions on planning and allocation? I just wanted to make a comment about, um, leading on from Anne's comment about quality home modification services, and the role of quality experienced occupational therapists in providing that. Um, so yes, while it's true that um, a number of private occupational therapy services have come out of the woodwork in the Hunter region, um, a lot of those services do not have the skill level to be able to provide these complex modifications that, as you were mentioning, these younger people with a disability require. They haven't had the experience working in the area um, to be able to provide it. Um, so I guess looking at the workforce into the future, when you are potentially losing the experienced occupational therapist from the health domain, um, the extra cost that it's going to take to be actually fixing up these modifications and to put extra hours into providing the private OT services as well. Um. Yeah, well not, they're not all. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that um, there's that many extras in the hunter at the moment. But there are a lot of experienced occupational therapists and physios um, and speech pathologists, for that matter, who've been working in personal injury and who are available in the um, to the sector. The but the other thing is that we uh, won't just take any prescription that we get. We do have our own quality controls internally. We do have um, access to people with expertise. And, uh, and we would certainly go external if we had any concerns about um, something that was provided to us. So we are looking for expertise. We're looking for the quality. And we're also looking for those therapists who not only want to write a prescription, but they want to make sure that it actually is um, uh, constructed in the correct way or delivered, supplied in the correct way, and that the person actually is able to make use of it. So we're expecting them to have that um, more comprehensive follow through to ensure that it works for the person and it is fit for purpose. Any other? Yes. Um, I'll go first to Philippa. And then <coughs> uh, will you do what NABLE has done where a person being able to prescribe certain um, equipment has to have already had a proven record of three applications or some sort of criteria around that for... Um, prescribing modifications? Would you look at something like that? We may, we may not either. Uh, no, what, um, we're working with the enable arrangements at the moment and, uh, but uh, as I said, we, we are talking to the professional associations and, uh, and I think we need to get on their agenda that we need um, appropriately accredited continuing professional education courses that we can then go, okay, I'm, I'm accredited in X, Y or whatever. Um, and, uh, and that, that will be whatever it, it turns out to be, whether it's writing three prescriptions or not, you know, I, I understand they've got their internal people who can check those and then say, it's a standard. That's certainly what we're after, people who've got the expertise to do the job and do it well. Um, and, and we are looking to um, have access to uh, specialists, um, uh, specialists in the various fields where we do have questions that we may need to throw to them to make sure that we are getting a, um, a quality product. Oh, hi. Um, I think this question's probably for Wendy. Um, I'm wondering how you're going about planning to dismantle the three-tier system in New South Wales and whether you've got time frames on that. Well, to be honest, we probably don't intend to dismantle and reconstruct anything because our dismantling is 
transitioning to the NDIS. So certainly what we've seen in the Hunter is that providers transition, uh, there's a schedule of transitioning for, for individual providers based at the moment on where they're located. So each quarter, um, ADEC and the NDIA and providers had decided when there'd be clumps of transitioning happening. So every provider transitions, all the clients attached to that provider, as well as any other pr services that clients are getting, transitions over to the NDIA. So under that model, there is no need to deconstruct and build something new. And to be honest, at this stage, we're really focusing on getting every ready, everyone ready for individualising rather than changing a tier structure when we haven't had too much luck doing so in the past uh, and we only have a short time frame to, to get ready for individualisation into the future. Having said that, we're still in the process of working out what statewide rollout will look like in conjunction with the Commonwealth and we don't know what that will be. So there could actually be some changes under it due to that, but really it's more about the individual and focusing on transitioning them rather than the existing service structures that we have in place. Yeah, uh, Ron Rademacher from Fusion Metro uh, Northwest. Uh, just a formulated question here. We we want continuity of service, and we've just been talking about OTs. So I'm the builder for the service, and um, I'm aware that there's a register for builders that they can put their name on, and and they're the ones that the assessment group would sort of farm out. This is my understanding of the work, and they would quote on it and come back. Uh, my question is, uh, who is vetting these builders that come onto that register? Because we, we've actually had um, builders do work for us that we no longer allow to do work for us, but I would, ha I would hazard that they would put their name up because they said, we've done home odds in the past. Um, so, are you talking about the NDIA register? Yeah, okay. Um, so we do have a way that, um, <coughs> that um, practitioners of all kinds and service providers are able to um, register with the agency to provide a service. With a um, builder, we'd expect them to be licensed, you know, in the appropriate way, et cetera, et cetera. That, of course, of itself doesn't guarantee quality. Um, and I've just, we've just had our first encounter with a non-quality builder in another state. Um, so, you know, everyone's learned from that. Um, but um, one of the... But at the moment, we're not fast because we've got the uh, Lake Macquarie home modifications who are, are you know, who we're working with. So we've actually got all those, um, you know, sureties um, in place in Hunter. Um, there will be some others probably that will, you know, put their name down. Whether or not... It's not us who select the, um, the pra um, tradesman or the practitioner. It's actually the person themselves. Uh, we can provide assistance to someone who does need it, um, but often it won't, when you've got an occupational therapist who's actually uh, recommending certain modifications, they've probably got people that they've worked with in the past anyway, so undoubtedly they would be making a recommendation to the participant that, that you might like to see these. Once again, depending on price, uh, we would be, or, you know, the... the estimated cost of the job, we would be looking for co um, competitive quotes um, and, you know, that happens in, in just general life. I'm doing an under undertaking a renovation myself right at the moment. <laughs> I'm right in it. Um, okay. Well, just to continue perhaps on that same theme, um, I mean, what's happening here with um, reform and transition is... I mean, let's be honest, the government's trying to create efficiencies and cost savings, yeah? And by outsourcing some of the services, uh, that's how cost savings come about because you're um, lightening the burden on the public purse. Now, with outsourcing, you will get a raft of subbies. That's happening all over the place. So we can't guarantee it's not going to happen with, your, um, with the outsourcing to whoever wins the tenders. They'll get subbies. My question is, how, do you um, how are you going to um, guarantee the quality of service at the operational level, especially for the over 65 or 70s who are frail, who don't always have someone to advocate or champion their interests? The policing of the quality of service, how are you going to monitor that at the operational level, face to face for the client? Well, I'll, I'll talk about ours. Like ours are under 65, obviously, but a lot of people do have some difficulties that may um, 
mean that they're not as uh, as able as others to manage. Um, and let's be honest, a lot of people in the community can't manage the trades people who come and do work um, on their house, etc., or their car. So, um, I mean, we expect all the usual guarantees. So we expect the insurances, the licences, etc., the certifications that are necessary uh, to carry out the particular job that's actually being done. So, uh, and, and, uh, and I mean, we have to rely on that. We, for larger jobs, we'll be appointing project managers so that we've got somebody who's actually got the know-how and skill to advise on whether or not, as the job progresses, it's actually being done in accordance with the specifications and at the quality that we require. So we will, we will be utilising people with um, skills and knowledge to actually assist that process. Um, the same as you would if you were having, you know, something major done on your own place. You would, you know, you would expect that. At the end of the day, there is redress. I mean, for a person um, with NDIS, the, the good thing is they've got the backing of the agency. Um, and so that way that, you know, that they're not left on their own, in other words, and we would be taking up um, the issues on their behalf and making sure the job is rectified. At the same time, we would also be looking to take action through either fair trading or whatever is the appropriate um, body who deals with those things. Yeah, Lynn Ridley from Scope Access. Can you explain why current funded services have to go through third party verification when other builders can just apply to go on to the NDIS registered list? I can certainly speak to third party verification because that's a current requirement of the ADEC funding agreement. So anybody that has a funding agreement with ADEC who provides disability services uh, has to go through third party verification because that's a requirement of the current Disability Services Act 1993. So that is our current quality system. Um, we have had many incarnations of quality systems as I'm sure you're aware over the years. That is the current one. There have been exceptions put in place for CCSP providers because of the community care common standards and an acknowledgement that people don't want to have to duplicate systems. So um, disability providers don't, if, if you go through the CCCS, you don't actually have to renew your quality until the following funding agreement. Into the future though, as Mary spoke about before, that will be an NDIA decision about what quality requirements are going to be in place. Um, but the difference between the NDIA register is people just putting their names down to be a potential provider as opposed to people who have existing funding agreements with ADEC. Although, I mean, I'd have to go and check this. I can't remember every detail of every um, registration we have. But um, we are, util are utilising all the current quality standards that exist in the jurisdiction that we're operating in at the moment. So if that's a requirement, we would be pointing uh, the people to actually go and, and um, if, if they haven't already obtained it, they've got to actually then meet the, the standards as appropriate. Yeah, g'day. My name's Phil Oliver from um, MacArthur. Um, building supervisor there. It's, uh, my question is on about the building aspect. It's about the lawnmower maintenance programs that are operating all around the place. Um, what strategies are going to be in place for a, um, a turnover, if I'd call it that, of the clients and the subcontractors to do these lawns? Is there anything in place or a strategy that's going to occur to make a transition um, for the client more so? I think um, if I understand the question, it's a bit similar to the first one we had around um, what are the changes and what does that mean for individual clients and what does it mean for providers. So in terms of um, home maintenance, really we're just trying to make sure that what's delivered aligns with the intent of what's going to be effective in keeping someone in their own home and to separate out those things which actually contribute towards those which are in contrast to those that are kind of the nice to have. Um, we will work closely with NACA around the transition arrangements and um, a lot of these things will be detailed in subsequent documents. So at the moment we're at the discussion paper phase which is pretty high level and policy direction. Next steps will be the program manual which will come out later this year which will have a lot more detail and things like program guidelines and so on. Um, so I'm not sure, I think it'll depend by providers around how much they already align to that sort of intent of services which are important in keeping people at home versus those things which are a bit more um, sort of optional or nice to have.
Sure. So, sorry, I, I misunderstood. I thought you were talking more about what happens specifically around that service type. Generally, or more generally, over the next um, coming months, hopefully next month or two, we'll be able to come out and give clear advice on what's the process for selecting providers. That will give certainty around either for the service you deliver, you have to go through a competitive process, or alternatively, we'll be maintaining existing providers. That will be, from that point on, then you can start advising clients around, here's the path forward. Um, if it does happen to be a competitive process, then here are the timeframes for when we'll know the outcome of that. And then, as part of that, they'll have sufficient time for transition out for providers that aren't successful. Would you please thank Rajan Martin, Mary Hawkes, Wendy Nola, Michelle Newman, and Anne Reeve. <laughs> <laughs>